So here's an example of replication. How does the Google file system do replication? Before that, let's talk about what the Google file system is. As the name suggests, it's a file system and it's meant to store large files. The files can be multi-gigabyte and the data can be in the terabytes. Right, so we're talking really large file, similar to files that Google uses to store the internet. So when you have these large files to store, you can either buy really large and expensive storage racks, or you can use cheap commodity machines, which are your average CPUs, and use thousands of these and have them coordinate with each other to store these files. And this is what Google File System does. So why are we looking at the Google File System? Because it is a classical example of a distributed file system. It's not a new system by any means. Uh, the paper came out in 2003, but since then, a lot of systems have used this as inspiration, most notably the Hadoop file system, which is directly inspired by the Google file system and is very commonly used today. In fact, it's not clear if Google still uses the Google file system internally. They keep iterating and developing new systems on top of them, so it's, it's not clear if this is still in use. We're going to focus on the replication part of it for now. The file system itself is a huge topic with several components. We're going to focus on replication. So let's say we have these three machines. Each of these machines has a hard drive. And let's say we want to write a piece of data. So let's say there's this block of data that's like uh, 64 megabytes, and we want to write it to three machines. Right Now, Google File System typically, by default, has a replication factor of three, which means every block is replicated to three machines. And these three machines are one of the thousands of other machines in this cluster. Let's say that we have logic that tells you for block X, machine A, B, and C are where you write it. Okay? So let's see how this works. Okay, so you have a client that's writing this block into these three machines. Now there's another machine here, which is the master, which stores which data should go in which machine. So block X is here. Master knows which machines block X should go to. So the first thing the client does is that it contacts the master, asking it which machines it should write to. The master replies with a list of replicas, a list of machines. And so the master says, write to machine A, B, and C. And the master also picks one of these as primary. So the master picks, let's say, B as the primary. And we'll get into why that's important in a bit. So B is primary, and A and C are secondary copies of this data. So at this point, the client says, okay, I'm going to store these three machines so that I know where I'm going to write from now on. So I don't need to contact the master again. So at this point, the client is done interacting with the master. The client can now coordinate with these three machines to write this block of data. If you were to coordinate with the master and if the data flowed through the master, that's not very efficient because the master would become a bottleneck. Otherwise, every client would be interacting with the master for every single write. So every single write would be going through a master, which is really not efficient because the master becomes the bottleneck. So the master is only used to get metadata about which machine to write to. So the client now knows that it needs to write to machines A, B, and C, and machine B is the primary copy. 